Yes, my lovely, lovely imps. I have now seen Dune 2. Dune Tuner. Dune 2. I've seen Dune 2. And I actually quite enjoyed it. But I wanted to talk about it a little bit. There's so much that I was thinking about when I was watching Dune 2. I am a very, very big fan of the Dune universe. I love the Dune games. I've played a whole bunch of them. The first Dune thing that I ever had contact with was actually David Lynch's Dune, which I love. And I know that David Lynch himself, uh, he David Lynch describes the Lynch Dune as a great sorrow of his life, which is one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever heard ever because even in its flawed and imperfect state it is still in my opinion a really enjoyable film specifically because it really went there okay so that that was my introduction okay it really went there with the psychedelics it really went there with the strange designs with the otherworldly feelings it was doing a lot of stuff and it is imperfect don't get me wrong there's flaws in that film but i still like it that was my introduction to dune and I saw it as a very young kid. I'm talking like I must have been six or seven, maybe eight, when I saw Dune the first time. And I won't lie, it scared me shitless. Just so we're 100%, I was scared out of my mind by half of the stuff that happened in Dune. But it also made me kind of fall in love with that universe. And throughout the years, I played various Dune things. I enjoyed Dune art. And then I... Uh, fairly recently decided I'm going to actually read, finally read through the entire Dune series, which has been a great decision. Really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the Dune Part 1, and I expressed in my review of Dune 1 some of my mild criticisms. And I just saw Dune 2. And I have so many thoughts. First of all, I think that Dune Part 2 is a stronger movie than Dune Part 1. I think... Uh, it is just all around pretty much better in every aspect, with very few exceptions. The movie looks better. The, the, the pacing, uh, while a little bit fast, definitely feels a little more uh, engaging and exciting. The special effects look even better than the first one. Um, maybe the soundtrack was a little stronger in the first one, but I haven't made up my mind on that. Um... And there was, there was a lot of stuff that I really enjoyed about Dune 2. Um, the, the camera work was fantastic. The, the casting was spot on. In fact, I think that's probably my favorite thing about Dune 2. Um, uh, Timothy Chalamet is an absolutely incredible yeller. Like, seriously. My friend said it was hot when Timothy Chalamet yelled. And I was like, huh? And then I went and saw the movie, and I'm like, half of his lines in the movie are him fucking losing it. Just screaming at the top of his lungs. And it was awesome. I loved it. He ha like he really gives it his all. And he's good at it. He screams well. It was great. Um, the, they, the Emperor, uh, Emperor Shaddam IV... Uh, of House Carino, the Emperor of the Known Universe, is played by Christopher Walken, which is such a perfect fit. I literally, I can't even imagine a better fit than that. Um, huge shout out um, to uh, Leah Sadu. Leah Sadu played um, Lady Fenring. Fenring, I think is how it's pronounced. Lady Fenring. Um, and even though her part was fairly small, she absolutely sold it. Um, what? Oh, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, Austin Butler. That's what I was blanking on his name. Austin Butler played Fade Rotha. Nailed it. Just did a great job. A very, very different interpretation than other ones that I've seen of Fade Rotha. 
um, but I really liked it. Uh, he played the character very well, uh, kind of like a dangerous, but ultimately somewhat naive sociopath. Um, and he, he just nailed the, the role really well. Of course, we have a lot of uh, returning roles. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I did actually like Javier Bardem as Stilgar. Although a lot of people said he was kind of hamming up the accent a little bit. And I do agree that was a little bit strange. But um, but I do still think the performance was very good. And he really looked great. He definitely sold the the gravity and, uh, and religiosity of the Stilgar character. Um, yeah. Um, hold on one second. Um, Rebecca Ferguson played, uh, uh, Jessica again, returned to, for the role of Jessica, but they had her tricked out with these face tattoos because in this film, uh, she is sort of enlightened to the position of a, uh, like a religious leader. Um, and she actually like, she basically becomes a different person. Um, I'll get into like the plot stuff in a minute. I'm just kind of talking about the different roles that I thought were very well for, very well done for right now. Um, also, uh, the, the 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 sort of visuals of the film, while the first one had also had really really solid visuals, um, I feel like this one was a little more bold overall um, with with the, the 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 parts of the world that they decided to show, and this especially came to a peak when they visited uh, Gady Prime, the home world of the Harkonnens. And I learned after seeing the film that they actually shot that entire section on infrared film. The entire section on Gady Prime was um, essentially all black and white, and it was mega high contrast. Like I'm talking people's skin seemed to glow with like, like, like polished marble. It was upsetting. Uh, and the, the, like, it was the deepest, darkest black point that you can possibly imagine. It was all the brightest whites and the darkest blacks you could possibly imagine as far as color is concerned. And the, everything about that section felt like an upsetting and somewhat sickening dream. Uh, they had these really cool effects where they had these fireworks that weren't actually fireworks, but they were like, they were like cannon shots that blew up into like goo or ink. And they were, they were detonating up in the air with these ink bombs that were like black ink and splattering all over the place. And the, the base was just thumping the entire time. There's a, a deranged bloodthirsty crowd. Amazing. They had these really cool in that section. Um, there's like an arena battle in that part of the movie. And they had these, these, uh, like attendants that were like a uh, gladiatorial attendants and they were wearing like latex outfits with these enormous, like six foot long horns, giving them the look of like a, uh, they looked like a Hercules beetle walking around with little whips. And it was amazing. I, I loved it. Oh my God. It was, it was incredible and of course they had like i said a uh, lady lady fenrig ring lady fenring played by leah sadu was featured in this section and she nailed the mood very well she was doing some psychic witch stuff amazing um the worms looked awesome all of the ships that they showed they revealed a lot more spacecraft in this one and they all, the designs were all really spot on and weird. At one point in the movie, there was like a, um, there was like a, 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 it looked like a, like a lotus seed pod. If you know what I'm talking about, you guys know everybody. That's like the iconic tryptophobia, uh, image where it's got like these weird, they had a ship that looked like that. It was like a, a heart shaped ship that had a bunch of holes in it that fired out a bunch of missiles crazy, disgusting. There was a, there was a Harkonnen ship that was like a, a giant bloated tick. It was like a harvester that was carrying, or it was a, a like almost looked like a balloon that was harvesting a, a, uh, or that was carrying a harvester. 
and it looked like this big bloated tick just with a thing hanging off of it. They, it was awesome. The the mood setting, the visual choices, the uh, uh, the camera work uh, was great, and the special effects really really did blend uh, very seamlessly with the rest of the film which is something that a lot of movies struggle with. Even with the extremely advanced CGI technology that exists now, a lot of movies um, have the tendency of giving the impression that the actor isn't actually there. And that didn't happen in this film at all, basically. Um, they did a very good job of, of, of using the CGI uh, in such a way that it didn't feel like you were watching a character on a soundstage. It felt like they were in the location, even when they sometimes obviously weren't because you can't be on a weird alien spacecraft. Um, all of that was really solid. Um, there was a couple of things that I had some issues with in this film that I wanted to talk about. And the first one is probably the most glaring issue. And this is the same problem, by the way, that I had with the first Dune movie, which is that... <laughs> and this is actually the first thing I said after I walked out of the movie. Uh, I was shocked at the decision to make a like the most famous piece of sci-fi about psychedelics into a movie about Xanax. W very, very weird decision. I do not know why they did that. I have no idea what the decision, what, what, where the brain process was. Because Dune is so weird in that way, okay? It is very strange. Um, when you, you, the books, the Dune, inter uh, the, the Dave, David Lynch Dune, these are all movies, or these are all pieces of media that embrace the, and even the games often will embrace the weird psychedelic, it depends on the game, I guess, but they'll embrace at least portions of it. Um, in Dune, the presentation of dreams and the narration of characters' thought patterns when they are on, when they are like, in an environment that is literally saturated with a with a hallucinogenic drug, it it is. You will get disoriented reading Dune, and aspects of that, like psychological psychedelic uh, disorientation, are present in other interpretations of Dune, and they are just really not here in the Denis Villeneuve Dune. Um, I was very surprised by that. The only scene, and this was my favorite scene, is the one that I already mentioned, which is the, the Gady Prime birthday uh, infrared scene, which truly felt like you were experiencing something trippy. There's actually, there's a scene in the movie um, where Paul, our main character, Moadib, uh, consumes this uh, this liquid that's called the water of life. And the water of life in the Dune books is basically, um, it's basically like, a, it's always described as a poison. It's basically um, Datura, like a, 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 a nightmare hallucinogenic drug that can kill you and does make you have a bad time no matter what. No one will ever have a good time drinking the water of life. Um, and in fact, like the ritual that is involved with the water of life uh, usually kills somebody, if not multiple people. And in the movie, he drinks this and he has kind of like a cloudy bad dream and then goes to sleep. And I was so surprised at that decision. To, to, to have, like, the scene basically just be kind of like a... You're, he kind of has, like, a mushy dream. And then it just is over. And he's just... He's like, oh, I'm going to sleep. And I, I was like, bro, I, I don't get it. I was very confused. Uh, Olix Love says, doesn't it kill any male that drinks it? Yes. 
in um in the universe of Dune, it will kill any male that drinks it. However, um, that's actually not a hundred percent accurate because actually the reason that it kills any male that drinks it is because it will actually kill anyone that drinks it. However, in the universe, the Bene Gesserit, which is an all-female order of psychic women, more or less, the Bene Gesserit train themselves to psychically modify chemicals. So if they drink a poison, they can like sort of go into a trance state and they can use their minds to change the chemical structure of poisons. So the real reason for why males always die when they drink the poison is because the only other people who drink it generally are Bene Gesserit women. And they have the ability to transform the poison into something else. So it's kind of a little bit misleading there. But yes, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so those were some of the things that that those were some of my thoughts about the Dune 2 movie. And I have another criticism, which is that the movie needed to be a lot longer or they needed to make a third part, in my opinion. One of the biggest problems of the uh, of of this film was that it felt uh, it felt like the, they were rushing through the plot. And that's both in comparison to the book, which it is an adaptation of, and also just generally. In the, in the book, the, what happens in the movie, okay, sorry, I should start this way. In the movie, the events that are depicted on screen occur in about a span of six months is what is the time that is shown on the, you know, on screen. In the books, the period the same period for all of those same events to happen is closer to about five years, like somewhere between two to five years. And um, it really shows, most of the time, this type of thing wouldn't really matter because, you know, uh, you can just kind of be like, uh, well, whatever, we're not gonna show that time in the same way or we're gonna avoid talking about the exact time. But in this movie, they actually really did put a time limit on themselves because at the beginning of the movie, we learn for sure that, or actually at the end of the first movie, we learn that Lady Jessica is pregnant with a baby. And so she's pregnant at the very beginning of this movie and she's still pregnant at the end of this movie and she's not close to having the baby yet. She still has months to go. In fact, I think they literally say, I've been pregnant for six months at, some, at one point. And uh, that's kind of an interesting decision because what the events that are actually depicted in the movie are pretty goddamn intense. Um, over the course, you're, we're supposed to kind of buy the idea that over the course of six months, like almost an entire war unfolds uh, um, and also a religion is built and it starts to strain believability. Um, not just as a product of the like claimed time that, 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 you know, is, is, uh, is sort of, you know, they say, oh, it's only happened in six months and you go, Re really? This whole war unfolded in six months? Like before a baby was born, you managed to do like an entire planetary war and also build a new religion. That, that's a little bit, hmm. But also there's another problem, which is that it's reinforced by the fact that the screen time for everything that needs to happen feels extremely truncated. We see uh, very scarce few uh, conflicts in a war that we're constantly told is happening. They mention, oh, the war is happening, the war is happening. And there's basically like one major conflict scene in the war. And that scene is to do all of the heavy lifting for an entire planetary war. And in the books, of course, it couldn't be further from that. In the books, there's not only is there like a time skip where we find through a very strange process of, 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 of a stoned out of his mind, tripping balls, Paul thinking back on what happened. But there's like a time skip with his like, his like LSD memories. But also the book has just hundreds of pages devoted 
to various war activities and war strategizing. And it's really good and fun um, and interesting that happens between Paul, the Fremen, and the Harkonnens. That, that struggle is really built up as a part of the story. And it just isn't on the screen in this uh, part Dune Part 2 movie. You Characters reference it a lot. They say, oh, we've been struggling on Dune for a long time, but it's not actually shown all that much. And it's a little bit unfortunate. Um, actually, it's really unfortunate. And I feel like with more screen time, the movie would have been a lot stronger, or even just doing another movie. Having this part say what it does and then have another movie to do a whole bunch of other stuff. I feel like that would have actually been a really good call um, because it feels rushed and it it damages the uh, it damages its own storytelling and also feels like certain things are completely rushed through. Um, the the drinking of the Paul drinking the water of life, which is forbidden because he's a he's a he's a man. He's not supposed to drink the water of life, and yet he does it anyway to prove a prophecy, um, and which is of course a fundamental deception. Is not given the time that it needs. That is an incredibly important moment in the narrative. It's incredibly important to the themes of the film. Dune Two being a movie that you know talks about the nature of mes of of a messiah. It talks about the nature of religion. It talks about like uh, fate and whether or not we can change what we are the, the the like sort of paths that we're set on, and it also and and that moment is a pivotal moment in Paul's character arc. You know, um, he's uh, in in that moment he's kind of deciding in a lot of ways to become something that that he doesn't want to be, and that's another weird thing. Because in the movie, he spends most of the movie basically saying that he doesn't, I don't want to be the Messiah. I don't want to run, lead a jihad. I don't want to do any of that. And then he just kind of has a moment of where he just snaps. He just kind of does it. And he's like, actually, I changed my mind. And this is very different from the book, by the way. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, adaptations they're different than the, the thing that they're adapting, but nonetheless, they're tied to it. In the book, the process of, of Paul becoming uh, becoming the Lisan Al-Gib. Al-Gib? Lisan Al-Gib? Lisan Al-Gib. I always pronounce it wrong. Um, the, the, this Messiah figure is one of him continually making decisions that, that like... He, he basically keeps making exceptions. He's just like, ah, I don't want to become the Messiah, but God, it would be so convenient and perfect and strategic for me to make this decision here. And I can see that if I make this decision, it will put me closer to becoming something that I claim not to want to be. And we don't really see any of that in the movie. We just kind of see him. He basically takes a drug and has a personality change, which is not at all what what Dune like happen. Like the book is not about that portion at all. It's not like you take a drug and you become a bad person. Uh, in fact, it's a very very specific critique of religious leadership and 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 hero worship that the movie fails to deliver on. And as a result, Dune two has a problem in undercutting its own message and its critique of, of Messiah, which it is doing. It is definitely a movie that is trying to critique the concept of Messiahs. It is trying to critique the concept of apocalyptic religions. Um, it is definitely trying to do that, but it, it has a shallow critique as a result of not having enough time for us to truly see um, what Paul is struggling with and the choices that he is making that leads him to that place. Um, yeah. And um, as a longtime book fan, I respect your critiques, but I have major disagreements. I mean, sure. Uh, and I'm, I'm totally open to hear those, but this is sort of my read uh, of this and my comparison from my experience reading the book versus, um, versus the, the film. And there are aspects that are similar. Like, there are things that do change Paul 
Like, I mean, his experience with Spice, basically, Paul is the most abused, like, child who has ever lived in the Dune universe. He's been, like, triplicately groomed by, like, three different organizations. I mean that, literally. He's been, like, triplicately groomed. He's been groomed by the Bene Gesserit. He's been groomed by, uh, by the Atreides, um, by the Atreides, uh, like, house royal culture and he's also been groomed by mentat training which like mentat training is like a grueling process that teaches your brain to be a computer and um when he when he takes the spice it kind of makes him have a mental breakdown which is depicted in both uh the movies and the book um and that does definitely change him uh because he he can't exactly handle it but it's not really the main thing that uh, uh, it's not like that's not the one thing that does it. It's not like that's the thing that breaks him and he becomes like an like a overnight becomes like a like an evil character. He has multiple moments throughout the books where he makes decisions that put him on a different path, where he struggles with whether or not he actually wants to be this thing that he sees in his future. He wants to on on one hand he seems like he wants to avoid it because it, it doesn't match with his conceptualization of self. Um, and it, it's not quite the, that, that doesn't quite hit to the same degree in the movie. And in my opinion, the movie's critique of, of the Messiah figure uh, struggles as a result. Um, that is true. Um, they, they do, uh, 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 as Not an Android says, uh, Not an Android says, Paul wasn't as self-reflective in the movie, but I feel like Chani filled that role. It's true, but it has a different effect. It is true that Chani, Chani's role was largely to, uh, sort of represent what, what Paul claims he wants to be. Like somebody who is fighting for what he believes in and not just for power. But that's, but, and that part is good. His dynamic with Chani as portrayed in the movie is, hits really hard and it's good. But it doesn't have the same effect of like portraying someone coming to different junctures and continually sort of siding with the one that gives him more power. Find, basically coming to a, a juncture and going, yeah, but I, I'd do better in the war. I'd be able to save these people if I took this power. And that power basically pulling him towards a destiny that he doesn't seem to want to, he on one hand doesn't seem to want to fulfill, but at, as he goes into it more and more, he becomes more and more of that person that he initially said he didn't want to be. And that doesn't work as well in the film, even with the Chani thing, because it's external now. It's his disagreement with another character as opposed to a conflict that's happening with his, within himself. It's still present, but it's very different. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, there is another pyro guy in chat says, my biggest problem with the part two film is the lack of the spacing guild and chome in general. But I think that Villanueva did a good job at adapting something with a limited runtime. Um, so I was shocked at the sort of lack of mention of the spacing guild, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the, the movies, because I feel like that's going to have a problem. And in fact, I, I kept kind of sticking on the spacing guild thing because I feel like it messes up um, the dynamic of the struggle. And let me explain. I'm going to get into some little lore stuff, okay? So in the Dune universe, there is, oh God, now I'm going to forget the term. See, this is the problem with me being a lore head. I remember the concept, but I don't remember the name. Okay, in Dune, there's basically this concept of uh, three powers that balance each other out in the universe. There is the empire, the emperor, the, the throne of the emperor. There is the Bene Gesserit order, and then there is the spacing guild, okay? These three, I can't remember the exact name that they call it. They call it something. It's like the triumvirate concordat or something, or the concordat, something like that. And those three 
are massive powers that are supposed to in the in the mythology of the uh, in the propaganda of the empire and of everybody else they're supposed to balance each other out it's a balance of power okay and the spacing guild is very enigmatic it is it is kept at a at an arm's distance for a lot of the books but it's present and it's mentioned and it is seen in its effects and it has implications that are very present that are totally not present in that are not present in the movies it's in fact it's barely mentioned in the movies everybody who knows dune knows the term knows the little phrase the spice must flow why must the spice flow well the answer is because the spice is a drug that allows for these these creatures these beings they're, they used to be humans and they're not really humans anymore but these beings called navigators uh they basically live a life of perpetually being tripping out of their mind on spice and it allows them to fold space and time and they can do that with enough spice they can do that on a level that they can tell like basically warp entire ships across the known universe and nobody else can do that and they cannot have a society that spans across the universe if they don't have interstellar travel and the only way to do interstellar travel in this universe is to have these guys hopped up on spice it is the only known way to do it the spice must flow because the spacing guild navigators need the spice to be able to make everything run people would be stranded on their own planets and the entire empire would crumble in an instant if the spice stopped flowing and they could not have the navigators continue to warp space and time that's the basic summary there's of course there's a little other there's other powers and stuff that's there for example there's the houses of the lands rad but that's getting into that those are a subsection of the empire uh, to a certain degree we'll we'll, we'll I don't want to get too complicated. I'm trying to keep it simple here to explain what I'm talking about with the movie. And I know it's not a perfect summary of the lore, but I think it's a pretty decent job, okay? Um, that's why the spice must flow. And in the movie, the absence, the spacer, the spacing guild is mentioned, I think, one time in the original movie. It's basically a line or two here or there. Um, and we don't understand why the spice really must flow we don't actually get why it must flow and also that upsets the power balance because part of the uh part of the intrigue and also part of what paul is able to do is that he's able to play these different factions against each other um and uh you know the fact that the empire is threatened not not just because uh of like money or anything like that but because paul is able to basically uh with, by allying with the fremen by organizing the fremen into a a uh you know fighting army a state unbelievably efficient fighting and killing machine by being able to monopolize all of the spice fields on arrakis he's able to basically choke or threaten the spacing guild, which in turn completely threatens the emperor. It's an interesting thing that's just not present. So instead what we have is sort of like a two party struggle um, that it it's an odd, it's an odd decision. And also of course, they missed out an opportunity uh, to depict some of the one, some of the weirdest stuff um, in the, uh, the weirdest stuff in the Dune universe. The Spacing Guild is a strange and fascinating and enigmatic organization. And of course, most people are very familiar with the, um, this character from the Lynch Dune, which, uh, people actually, there's a theory, and I don't know if this is true or not, um, but there is a theory that, uh, that, the Lynch Dune Guild Navigator design was so impactful that Frank Herbert actually incorporated it into his later books because there was no physical description of the Guild Navigators before um, 
Oh my God, what was the, I think it's called, uh, was it, fuck, oh no, now I'm not remembering which book it was in. Anyway, a book that came out like three or four years after the Lynch Dune. But this is the creature, of course. The, this human, vaguely humanoid, swollen brained thing with a weird triangular mouth. These guys don't appear at all. And there's no real stand in for them either. We just are kind of left in the dark as to why the spice is so important. Chapter House Dune. That's the one. Chapter House Dune. Previous to that, they're mentioned, their abilities are explained, but they're never physically described. And in Chapter House Dune, it's described specifically as having a big swollen head and a, a floppy nose and a triangular mouth, which is exactly how uh, it was depicted in the Lynch Dune. Um, and of course in the Lynch Dune, they were, it was a crazy hell of a scene. Like what a, what an amazing and, and transfixing scene. This, the revelation of this strange monster and its ability to travel through space. Um, not an Android says space folding is based on a technology called the Holtzman field. Yeah, but they can only use that technology because their brains are big enough to psionically engage with it. The navigators are only able to, to use the, the Holtzman field effect because their brains are so huge and psionic. They could have just yeeted themselves into the abyss of space until they reached Arrakis. Did they, okay, come on. You are, you are technicalitying me so hard right now. You might be right, Pyro Guy. And I said this was a theory. This was a theory that I read. So it is possible. Um, that there was a description of a navigator before this, but I, I don't know if that's true. I, 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 I would have to go and dig deeper and I'll, I'll be sure to pay attention and give an update as I'm reading through the books more. Uh, cause I have not yet read, uh, I have not yet finished Dune Messiah. So, you know, I have a ways to go and we'll see if we encounter another one. Regardless, the Lynch Dune navigator was a, a shocking and fascinating uh, interpretation and I liked it. Um, so, um, where was I? I got off on a navigator thing. There's no, there's no spacing guild. Um, there's no guild navigators. And so, um, the, the struggle feels a little different in the Dene, Denis Villanueve, uh, 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 Dune. Um, but, with all of these critiques said, I still really enjoyed the movie. And I want to give a special shout out to the sound design because um, it was great. The sound design used thudding bass so unbelievably well in that it really helped magnify the emotional experience. Everything in these films feels like a vibration, uh, a vibration of your goddamn bones. And I love that because of course, like it, it aligns thematically. On Dune, vibration calls worms. Every step is a potential thud that could call a worm. They use the thumpers. And throughout the entire film, there's this recurring, just, just barreling bass constantly for so many different things. Um, so I, I really, I really did enjoy, um, the, the sound design for these films, the, 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 the there's a lot of sound detail. I don't want to just fixate on the bass, but that was really the part that stood out. Like I mentioned in the Gady Prime, the, the Gady Prime segment, they have these, these jelly bomb fireworks that are just amazing. And each one of them comes with this like goopy thudding bass that sounds like you're listening to like an amniotic sack that has a bomb in it. It's crazy. And I love it. Um, I, I really, really enjoyed that. There's there, the, 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 the Dune part two, the Denis Villanueve uh, uh, Dune, it does epic very well. And I mean it, it really does. It, 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 it suffers in that it's a little bit more shallow than what I usually, you know, crave when I'm thinking of Dune. You know, the, there's a part, there's an aspect to, to everything Dune that is very messy and complicated and, and 
otherworldly and mind-bending that isn't 100% present in these ones. However, it, it does do the epic nature very well. Everything is larger than life and thudding and terrifying. And I like that. And dramatic. Um, while there's maybe a little too many slow-mo glamour shots, they look damn good. And I can't blame them for wanting to take as many slow-mo glamour shots as they did because they looked fucking incredible. Um, the characters... Uh, the outfit design is amazing. The, uh, uh, the, 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 the casting is perfect. And so you get amazing actors in amazing outfits with beautiful cinematography. And you have incredibly epic, breathtaking glamour shots at every turn. And it feels great. And it definitely sells uh, a, a, an exciting space adventure. And I think that it will, I think that these movies will provoke further interest in Dune. And I think people are going to be in for a real trip because uh, everything else Dune is off the walls, bonkers, dream world, nightmare stuff. And I love that. That's the stuff I love. Um, there were a lot of things that uh, I feel, I, I've been thinking about this movie a lot. As you can probably tell, I've been rambling about it for like almost an hour now. Um, and um, and there was a lot of, there's been so much stuff I've been thinking about in my head. One of the things that I've seen people talking about is like, you know, that they like to see when an adaptation really adds something of its own. You know, when it, when it brings something new to the... Uh, to, to the mythology. And at first I was kind of like, well, did they really succeed at that? And then I thought about it a little more and I think, yeah, they did. The One of the best examples was the little goofy thing that I did, at the, the little bit I did with the blah, 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 that shit. That stuff, the Sardaukar chants were, are actually a legitimate, like amazing touch. Like I actually think they're very cool and they add depth to the Sardaukar. And even in the books, um, we get a lot of lore and information about the Sardaukar, but but that that chanting scene, the ritual battle chant with the guy going, Burger Goblin, Burger Girl, whatever, amazing. And it's such a mood setter that you really, it sells the danger and the strangeness and the, the fucked up uh, uh, murder culture of the Sardaukar. I think that's awesome. I don't know if that part is actually throat singing. There's a lot of throat singing in the soundtracks, which is awesome. But I don't actually know if this, I mean, I guess they probably are. It's probably modulated throat singing, I guess. Um, in the, the uh, I should talk about the OSTs in a second and I will. Um, I don't know what they did to make the, the, the chant sound like that. Um, I really, really like throat singing. My viewers will know I pl regularly play many different, uh, you know, uh, throat singing uh, tracks. I'm a big fan of throat singing. I think it's a fascinating talent, and there are so many different versions of it that have their unique touch. It's something I really love. It appeals to me a lot. So I like that generally. Uh, I don't actually know if that's what they used. It does kind of sound like it, but it's also so modulated and w warped which I also like. Um, I think the Sardaukar were done very, very good by this adaptation. And uh, and I think that that alone is probably a really good, uh, a really uh, something that this adaptation adds to the mythology. I think that people are gonna think about the Sardaukar like that and think about their weird chants. I do, when I'm reading parts of the book, you know? Uh, another thing that I want to say that I think they did really good was the firearm weaponry is really great. There is a there's a specific scene in Dune Part 2 where they're doing a raid on a spice harvester. And they have an ornithopter, you know? And it's flying around and it has this gun that's like, it's like a... All I can describe it as like a space shotgun. And this, first of all, it sounds amazing. The sound design for it is just incredible. It's got this like, 
extremely weird rhythm to it and it, and is super, super punchy. And uh, I love the gun. And it, it, it's so cool and scary. And it's like, you get this shot of them flying around and aiming it and then it's just like, and it makes this like fucking monstrous noise. It's great. And I love that. I love that the, the Denis Villeneuve Dune um, spent a lot of time thinking about the weaponry. The las guns that they use, which are like a big part in the book, they're always talking about las guns. Um, there's a bunch of details about them that don't really matter uh, all that much for this conversation, but the las guns are a big thing. Uh, there's some special use cases, and they're very powerful, but they have massive drawbacks, and they can't always be used. And in this one, they they the las guns are like these big, these sweeping, instant cutting lasers. They're horrifying. They just metal disappears, gone, and you just there's a part where they slice a giant ship in half with this like like ground mounted gun, and it is it's great. It's, it's it's terrifying to think about, like uh, like a like an infinitely sharp beam that can cut through anything instantly, and they they can do it with no effort. They basically just move their body like this, and a gigantic structure just cuts in half. So cool. Um, so the the firearm weaponry in the uh, Denis Villeneuve uh, Dune is another thing that I think that they're going to add. That they're going to be able to add to the um oh and in the first uh the first dune they have these guns that shoot like drill bits they have these little pistols that go pew, and they shoot like a small drilling bullet that will drill through the shields and to my knowledge those were just invented like i don't think those bullets or guns exist at all in the uh in the text they were just like oh that kind of makes sense let's do it and that's fucking cool super cool um yeah, it's very, 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 very well done. Um, oh, yeah. There's one other criticism I wanted to bring up. This has been a little rambly, but I feel like I've talked about a lot of stuff and I feel good about what I've said so far. But there's one more thing that I want to bring up before I wrap this review up, um, which is there is one big criticism that I have, and it's in the depiction of... Fremen society um, that didn't make a lot of sense to me and I don't know why they chose this. So in all of the in all of the royal houses we see a cold uh, imperial austerity all of them even even in our good guys quote unquote the Atreides who are by comparison you know you know they're fairly nice oppressors basically uh they're mildly heroic oppressors um they're slightly easier to appreciate but in all of them we see very austere brutalist uh choices in design their structures are cold they're proper they're hyper clean they're sanitized and that's even true in arakeen which is a off-worlder built city basically uh, or at least most of what we see is. Uh, Arakeen is a city that was, uh, that was, you know, basically built for oppressors to live in and to be a central point for off-worlders to have their palaces and for the empire, emperor to visit and whatever. It's a off-worlder palace that has, like, you know, other people, you know, Fremen and whatever living around it. But the actual structures, the core structures uh, that are prominent in Arakeen are all these these cold and austere things. And in Dune 2, we get to see the inside of a siege. And in every other version of Dune, sieges are like, they're like a totally different world. They are full of life. There are gardens inside of sieges. There are factories and, and markets and you know, festivals, and there are, like, again, there are gardens and ecological research facilities inside of sieges. They're incredibly, like, lively, completely, they, they are purely Fremen culture. 
They are not, uh, there are, they are depicted as, uh, they're described in the books. Every room is like covered in brilliant tapestries because they live in, ca like the, the, the sieges are like cave cities. They're like built into mountains. They're like dug out of mountains. So they hang brilliant colored and patterned carpets and, and text textiles all over all of the walls. And they're like d described as very beautiful. Um, and then in this movie, they look like just normal ass caves. Every depiction of the inside of a siege that we get are basically brutalist caves, which made no sense to me. And I don't know why they made that decision. Um, it was a very, very weird, um, very, very weird decision. They look like, um, and, and also we, when we see depictions of, we see basically no depictions of Fremen life inside the siege, um, except for people sort of scurrying away and hiding, which is not how the sieges are depicted in the book or really in any other Dune media. In fact, uh, the sieges for the most part, outside of when they're like actively being attacked, are like full of life and food and, and all kinds of activity. Um, they're described as being places where like, uh, there's a there's a really great scene in the Dune book where Lady Jessica is considering the fact that sieges are so safe. They're especially in the south, which is where we see the siege in the Dune Part Two movie. They're so safe that people don't even think about the possibility of being poisoned. That they just make and bring coffee for each other. Like she can't even believe it because even in her home, even on her home planet. Uh, she could never do that. They always had to have like a person check for, check all their food for poison. And she will be sitting there and someone will just bring her a delicious cup of coffee, uh, like spiced coffee. Someone will just bring it into the room and she just can drink it without ever having to think. That's, that's the life that is depicted in the sieges and that we never see that. And it deeply undercuts the, the depiction of the Fremen. Um, yeah. I don't know. There was just nothing to go off of in uh, in Dune Two, and I do feel like that's a that was a mistake that I wanted to bring up because I think it's pretty bad. The Fremen are uh, central; uh, they are the most important group of people, single group of people in the entirety of Dune. Um, yeah, and to, to 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 sort of drop the ball on depicting their brilliant and and uh, the the whole p part of the point is that the the people who are involved in the empire are they've deranged themselves. They live miserable lives. They are richer than the entire universe can possibly imagine. Ninety percent of the entire universe cannot even imagine how rich the like the 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 nobles of the empire are and how luxurious their lives are and yet they're fundamentally uh bereft of even basic pleasures and that is something that becomes very apparent in uh uh the uh, in the depiction that is present in the books that that the fremen as uh brutal as their existence can be on a planet that is uh constantly working against them as as oppressed as they are as as much oppression as meted out on them um their cities are wondrous and thriving and incredible and as beautiful as anything you'd encounter anywhere else in the universe um so it was a miss on that front anyway i've been talking about this film for some time now and I want to just say, I do recommend it. I think you should go check it out. I do think it's a great movie. And it felt like seeing, it really, it really, it brought some, brought some joy back in my heart. You know, going to the theater and seeing a movie and just being like, damn, I had a good time. Even with all the things that I was like, hmm, I don't know what to think about certain aspects of the, of the plot and whatever. It was a fucking solid film. And it felt great. 
it felt great to go see a sci-fi film, a fiction sci-fi film, and not have it be, uh, you know, uh, cinematic universe weirdness, uh, uh, you know, product placement bullshit. It was very nice. And also to have it be technically and artistically competent. It has flaws, not perfect, but it's a really goddamn good movie. I highly recommend it. There are aspects that I think if you're a Dune fan, that they'll get lodged in your brain and you'll walk away from the film going, oh yeah, that is a part of the mythology of Dune for me. It is for me. I know now, whenever I think about the ornithopter weaponry, I've got that that fragmentation sh space shotgun mounted giant punt gun thing in my head. I know whenever I think about the... Uh, you know, whenever I think about the Sardaukar, I always think about that blah, 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 chat chant. Oh, good question. Trans girl Jade says the biggest question that needs answering though is, did you get a wormussy? I didn't, and I'm super bummed about it. Uh, I got in, and I really, really, really wanted to get the wormussy. For those who don't, you all know this is the most memed thing. Literally, the actors. And 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 uh, and interviewers and everybody's been talking about it. They've been making jokes about the wormosy, the the popcorn box. That's it's a it's a it's a worm hole. Okay, it's a worm hole. It it's a wormosy. Okay, um, the uh, the the whole. Uh, from what I understand, sorry, I rambled there for a second because I was looking at something. Basically, what I uh, found out is that the AMC theaters, which is where I went, uh, like drastically understocked the worm bucket. And so even though I, they were supposed to keep having it for some time, they were completely sold out. Um, and that sucked. So I didn't get my worm bucket. Um, I would love one. If anyone got an extra one and wants to send it to me, uh, shoot me an email at demonmamaonline at gmail.com and I would love that. I'll even buy it off of you for a reasonable price. But um, yeah, they totally didn't have enough. I couldn't pre-order it. I couldn't really, I couldn't get it. And that bummed me out. But you know, whatever. You live, you learn. I got to enjoy a bunch of delicious popcorn without the worm bucket. I would have really liked the worm bucket. But if anybody has an extra, tell me and email me. Also, if you enjoyed this long and passionate review of Dune 2, I strongly recommend that you press subscribe down below. I talk about a lot of different stuff. One of those is media that I'm passionate about. So if you had fun with this, if it got your brain working, if you end up going and watching the movie, subscribe. And also tell me. Tell me your thoughts about the movie down below. Tell me if you went and saw it. Let me know. I want to hear your Dune thoughts. I love Dune. I truly love Dune. Anyway, thank you for watching.